Hello, everyone. Today we are speaking with Eddie from Scottish Badgers. Eddie, we're so happy to have you here and to speak to you. For people who are not familiar with your organization, could you tell us a little bit about what it is you do? Yeah, we're a charity formed um, to serve Scotland, looking after badgers. And there was a reason for this in that soon after the Scottish government came into being, uh, that was 97, in 99 they had a meeting of what were then very informal badger groups in Scotland, there were four of us, brought us together and after a very strange one day meeting with all sorts of people there, decided that we should operate as a charity by ourselves, we, we should be volunteer, um, which did open us for some government grants as well, which was good, but basically we, we were set adrift by ourselves. So, so we've had 24 years now of operating, which is good, and we've got larger and larger, um, probably about 600 members now, uh, in desperate for people from some of the f further out parts of Scotland, you know, further away from the central belts, and we've about achieved that. So, um, yeah, and basically, if you ask what would the main thing is we do, we actually educate the public. So we've got one animal, a mammal, that has all, well, it doesn't have problems itself, but um, some people think it does, it's persecuted, though it's got full legal protection. And telling people about that, letting them know, um, is one of the main things we do, as well as people just enjoying seeing them. And okay. That sounds great. And I'm curious because I, from where I come from, I don't really know about badgers. And I was wondering, could you tell us like some facts or a little bit about badgers, something most people don't know? Yeah, well, the, the reason why most people don't know them and don't see them is that they're nocturnal. Well, we're not sure they were always nocturnal, maybe because of so many people around nowadays that they weren't. But they live underground, out of sight. They come out at night. So most of the population never see them at all. So they might see the odd sign that, you know, tells them about it. Uh, if badgers go and settle in people's gardens, which they do, that's one of the things we're often dealing with. And people vary in how they think about that. A, a, a lot of people are very delighted. They think it's great, you know. And probably um, people in urban areas. Um, and badgers are spread everywhere. Um, they're present in all the big cities in Scotland, so Aberdeen, uh, Glasgow, Edinburgh, especially Perth as well, uh, not so much Dundee, Inverness, which has expanded a lot. They live all around Inverness, so people will tend to come across them then. So there's a, quite a lot of surprise of, oh, I don't know how this animal operates, you know, or what, where it goes or what it does. So a lot of the life of badgers, their family life is virtually all secret underground, which makes it quite fascinating. And the reason they survive at all, two reasons really. One is that they can live almost anywhere. So urban, rural, um, yes, they like woodland, they like slopes in woodland, but in, in urban areas, they live um, under people's patios and um, you know terraces in the garden, um, anywhere they can get to really and the other thing is that they're, they're a very adaptable animal they, they eat almost anything um so they're they what, what they eat is quite widespread it's not just one thing if it was very limited they'd be in trouble actually you know they really would be um and and they take up space as well so badgers with a set they what they what they dig underground um which is tunnels and chambers and entrances um becomes fairly obvious and they're very territorial so badgers will stick to the same area they don't wander about all the time so a fox will go and dig a den maybe for one spring have young there and then they'll move on uh, and badgers don't they tend to stay in the same place mm -hmm. so in some ways they they can be easy to study nowadays and the thing that's made the difference is the uh the cost coming down of trail cameras so when people join us, almost the first thing they do is to go out and buy a camera <laughs> and then look for a set to put it at. So, I mean, we, we own four or five ourselves and we have three on our local set near to us. So, 
we want to follow their behavior all through the year you know and um i just carry on from that they, they have a very typical year as well um so we're just in the middle of the busy period now so female budgets have delayed implantation so they mate any time of the year but they become pregnant in december and they give birth to cubs about the first of february which is you know it's almost um maybe quite cool but also quite spooky about the fact they all come out at the same time and when the cubs are born and they're very dependent for february march april at least three months um last year's cubs the yearlings they start to wonder um, we don't know if the parents say go away you're grown up now but um they're naive so that's why so many badgers get killed on the road we have this period in the early part of the year with, with enormous numbers killed then another peak in the autumn when they also wander before winter and november december january um they have um become much less active people often don't see them they think the set might be dead and they don't hibernate they're going to torpor they're underground and for september or october they've been feeding up for that so badgers traditionally go out especially eat fruit in the autumn they they, they love fruit they go for any mm. sorts of fruit um and the rest of the year their the main diet is invertebrates and worms earthworms and what they really want um, a lot of people don't know that you know they think all sorts of things about badgers but they they snuffle slowly along the ground uh, with their noses in the ground and eating what's there and th th that's basically what they do all night <laughs> you know, they come out at night they've got to feed and they'll they'll be tripping back in the early morning you know in before dark maybe but then you get exceptions so um best time of seeing badgers which people often really want to know uh i would say may and june because may the cubs are above ground and they come out and the parents are keeping an eye on them so they play a lot so may is great for that and you see we get to lots of lots of lovely camera footage in that part of the year and the parents have really got until about august to teach them how to go and feed themselves um because they the mother's milk will have given up by then they'll be on their own you know um so they're vulnerable in that way um if we have a dry spring a lot of people might like that but it's it can be very serious for badgers um uh, quite a lot of die thirst and hunger you know in a dry spring so you don't want it too cold for them you don't want it too wet but you want a sort of um mild british climate you know where which just suits them so sometimes we get it and sometimes we don't but, i mean the very hot weather last year in july thankfully by then the cubs were really grown up and i don't think it probably affected badgers too badly but if it gets like that in um march or april that's that's really serious mm. what is the typical length of those tunnels that they live in how big is that right well we, yeah we, we we almost say that very differently no so you'll get holes in the ground the entrances and the tunnels will probably run at least 30 meters but they can be three-dimensional they can go along the ground they can go deep down depends on the infrastructure of the earth there you know what there is there um very difficult to predict so some sets have been where they've had to be done away with say for building work they the badge has been excluded and moved which is a very expensive difficult thing to do then they're going to fill them with concrete right in order to take the whole thing out and look at it and it's an amazing sort of maze of dead ends tunnels some chambers um but yeah, the, the safe working distance for people from a set is 30 meters. And that's because the tunnels can easily go out there from the furthest out holes in the set. You know, really difficult to predict, but it depends on whether in a hill or um, a hedgerow or, or whatever it is, you know, you can't predict quite what they're like, but, but and they can be very, very large sets as well. That's incredible. So you mentioned that the um, the cups they main what is their diet like? Is that mainly the the mother's milk? It's mother's milk. Yeah. Okay. Until so a couple of months, and then they. 
Yeah, it certainly happens to the mother. In fact, we've dealt just dealt with one case like that of um, um, if a lactating mother's found a sad fan on the road dead, which is what usually happens. Um, we have well, we try and find this nearby set. Usually, it will be about say 100 meters, probably nearer. And uh, in the case of two events I've done, we've put cameras out. We've caught cubs the first night either two or three of them, then we go and try and trap them. And I have a license from Nature Scott, I can do that bit. So it's removing them for their own safety. Because unless they go to an animal hospital to be fed, they won't survive. They won't survive mm -hmm. by themselves. So obviously that can be quite serious. And aside from being um, hit on the road, what other threats um, do, the, do the badgers face? What uh, what are the issues right now that are limiting their numbers? Yeah, well, the, it's it's everything mankind does actually. We're the we're the problem. So um, development of all sorts. So there's basically building work, forestry, and there's agriculture, and we deal with each sector like that quite a lot. Um, and um, basically, farmland they just need to be left. They need to be left alone. That's a problem. Um, the, the the large house builders the large forestry companies are okay they have a reputation to keep so they tend to keep to the rules which can be quite complicated at times so that they they deal with them as they should do um but the main thing is disturbance and unfortunately the thing we can't legislate for is their feeding area that's not covered so the set's meant to be totally protected so if we get evidence um people have damaged that we well the police are likely to get a prosecution um so the development there's road casualties which are to be fair the largest number of casualties um and then there's people who use them for dog fighting which is the uh the the, the, the least nice of all the things that happen to them and a lot of people are very confused by that or bemused and thinking you know why does this happen and the uh, badger baiting is all about dogs it, it's uh, it's one of the ways that people get caught as well it's about competition over breeding the fiercest dogs that they can and the badger is the main um, competitor the, the badger is the one that will fight against them but people who breed dogs like that and some of them are they'll be crossbreed you would never have seen um they the, people ask what that's all about it's about a pride in having the fiercest dog they can have and that that's what it's about mm -hmm. um and uh they'll, they'll set dogs on other dogs on cats on deer deer's quite favorite but badger if they can corner one is the fiercest opponent that's why they do it um people at times get uh tied up with well they must do it for money and there is betting on that but they don't necessarily do that people just go and kill them for you know uh, because they enjoy doing it frankly and um uh budget baiting operates by usually putting a terrier down in a set which will go down and try and uh, trap the badger the badger might kill that dog even then um the dog's got a radio collar on they track it from above and they dig down and take out the dog and the badger and they'll spend all night digging holes i've seen enormous holes 14 16 feet deep dug in a night you know um sometimes they bait it on the spot sometimes they take it away you can't tell but the the dogs which are the the fiercest for badgers is that they're dogs called bull lurchers so they're big heavily built bulldogs but they've got long legs they've got lurcher legs they can run and those are there's a pretty terrifying so just to say anybody watching this if you come across a news thing um on tv or radio and somebody says oh um this uh lady of 78 was killed by a dog in a house today you think what's going on there what's happening is that the son or nephew or grandson has given that dog for the elderly woman to keep to create, not to be suspicious they might have been banned from keeping dogs as well and something's gone wrong and sometimes it goes wrong when there's a child in the house so the sort of dogs bred for that they they, they are not tameable um they uh, and then they can't be around children they'll just kill them actually 
so it's pretty shocking that not many people come across that but it, it does happen regularly unfortunately yeah that's uh that's what i've never heard of that and yeah. i can imagine many people go on about life without really knowing uh yeah this <laughs> yeah what what happens uh, i just tell you a bit about the way people do get caught is that we work with the sspca special investigation unit who are great and they deal with two things they deal with puppy farming which is pretty bad and they deal with dog fighting and what they rely on is the public telling them about dogs that have been injured because if a dog's been in a fight with a badger it, it, it'll be hurt around the head and, and mouth and um so they might you know either get other evidence or get a photograph of that and if they can say that a dog or dogs live at a certain address they can get a warrant from a magistrate to have the house raided and the police serve the warrant the sspca go in and then they're allowed to take anything in the house for evidence and the thing that is the most valuable are people's mobile phones because they record everything and without going into any more detail that's the reason people are being caught now that the police and sspca are working very intelligently uh, with people's phone footage because people just like boasting about it so they'll mention people's names or something you know so mm -hmm. that all this intelligence being put together to um you know try and stop people yeah. it um it's it's quite uh sad that that this is happening to dogs and and also badgers i think mm. what what you said is that they see badgers as uh a fierce, a fierce opponent. opponent and i and i wonder aside from that why why are they being persecuted if they're not really doing anything they kind of do their own thing they might show up in people's gardens is yeah. there any other reasons that well might have yeah there's a couple of other things at the moment which are really unfortunate and one is the um bovine tb um in england uh, we don't have any bone vine TB in Scotland because the Scottish government, together with farmers, have kept it out. But in any parts of England, they have um, uh, bovine TB amongst cattle. Um, the, the scientific evidence does not point to badgers spreading that. And in fact, since they've been killing badgers in England, the TB numbers have not gone down they've stayed the same which says something about something you know but a lot of people get the idea we've got bovine tb in scotland which we haven't and i've got to say the scottish government it's um AFA, the animal plant and health agency are a very good agency they are so quick about things so what they're looking for is whether a farm has imported any cattle with tb from outside and they have done it happens maybe half a dozen times a year and as soon as that's discovered, they clamp down on the farm very quickly. So there are far tighter restrictions than in England. So you could say, well, England should could do something about this. They, they could do the same thing. Um, and the, uh, I mean, that, that herd won't move for probably at least six months, you know, until they're very sure we're testing that there's not an animal with bovine TB. And unfortunately, most of those are coming from Ireland, which has less strict rules about cattle movement than us. And that's just an unhappy thing, you know, a really sad thing. So badgers are our fourth largest mammal. So you've got red deer, roe deer, beavers now, that's the third, and badgers are the fourth. And and it's putting up with um, some persecution and dislike, you know, when it, when it re really shouldn't do. Yeah, badgers left alone will just get on with life by themselves. They... Um, I mean, they dig up the ground. That's the, the thing they do do. Yeah. And some people don't like that. Uh, whereas sets can be very fascinating apart from anything else. And we're sponsoring some research at the moment with a PhD student looking at the positive effects on um, on invertebrate um, health in the ground. Uh, and the signs that are looking very positive, actually, that badgers they 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 you know because they're dung they spread things like fruit seeds around and plant seeds so they're helping the um, biodiversity of their local areas and that all that works in its infancy actually it's uh you know still to be done a lot of it could you tell us a little bit more about the 
maybe the, the projects or the initiatives you're working on right now to help and protect badgers in Scotland? Yeah, sure, sure. The, the main thing we do, we've had um, four or five um, lottery grants in our time now, which is good going for us being a small charity. And between 2006 and nine, we ran a sample survey uh, of badgers in Scotland, and that was taking a thousand one kilometer squares and having them surveyed for badger signs. So we used about 500 volunteers for that. And we're repeating that now. And um, we're now into first winter, 300 volunteers working and, you know, recruiting more all the time. So we, you would hope that with, if persecution is lessening, the numbers would gradually go up. And badger numbers can't actually go up very fast because the, the average family size of cubs is two or three a year. And half of them die before end of the first year. So you can work out the arithmetic on that, you know, um, that's not a population going up an awful lot. <laughs> and yeah. oh yeah, it expands as there are new families, you know, and things like that. Um, but considering they've got to work out how to avoid, you know, new housing estates we're building and roads and railways, everything affects them. Um, and a lot of the people that work in those, those bodies are very good, actually. We work with railway people a lot of the time and the road people as well. So if you have a, a road like some of the ones in Scotland being uh, jeweled soon, although money stopping some of that, um, that all involves looking for a lot of wildlife and there are a lot of people working on it and they do it very well as well. Um, so um, raising awareness for people like that's important for us, you know. And so the survey is also recruiting more people to teach them about badges. So people are coming, and they're getting their learning skills and they're going out and doing something healthy. So going out in a small group, you know, to um, survey a square. Uh, the, the squares are quite good because a, a square kilometre could, could be very rough ground, but it can also be quite easy ground to cover in a day. So maybe four or five people go out together. and It's a very sociable sort of thing. And they're learning things all the time. They have to learn how to record batch of signs properly. That's the other thing. So we put in a lot of training. Um, I've got to say, we also work with, um, it's almost, it's not a sideline. It's been a spin-off from some of our other projects. Um, we worked on uh, one lottery project with school children, which was taught us an awful lot. It was really good. But we're now working with people with various difficulties, um, neuro-linguistic difficulties. We're working with... Um, refugees and, and asylum seekers in Glasgow who are coming out by just surveying. And that is, um, it's really good to see that. And it's making sure that this isn't some sort of activity for just a small part of the population, you know, because they know um, uh, if you take ecologists now, professional ecologists, they're tending to be white, middle class, and actually female, you know, so it's not representing the whole public. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, fantastic ecologists. We really do. They're great, lovely, um, and we're spreading, you know, work amongst other people, and of course, giving people something they've never done before as well. So, if people don't go out in the countryside very much, they're not going to go out and look for anything very different or special, you know. And so, we're getting a lot of rewards from all this, and we're learning a lot, and uh, a lot of people are being helped in ways that they haven't been before you know we just thought it was the right thing to do and we get rewards from that um it's it's a win-win situation you know it's, a, yeah. it's really good for the volunteers it's kind of a, an adventure basically it's something you would normally not do yeah it's quite exciting and people go to you know uh bits of habitat they've not been in before i mean we end up in a lot a lot of large woods and forests for example we end up on hills and mountains um but i just don't live in wet ground they're not in in boggy ground which is quite good i think um they can be on cliffs at the seaside they can be in sand dunes that, and that's the other thing you know you you remain surprised well yes taken about a surprise just where they can be because they can be all over the place actually you know uh, whole variety of places um and i was uh, looking through your website yeah. you have a lot of events going on 
next month, I believe you have a Badger Awareness Week. We do. Yes, that's right. In May. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, we have just a whole variety of things. So there'll be talks for people, say, in an evening. Um, there'll be activities for children. There'll be activities of various sorts of people. Um, it's trying to get the word out, but also giving people a good time as well, you know. Um, we, I mean, we teach people um, sort of outdoor issues. We, we have to teach map reading for people, you know, mm -hmm. who otherwise might not be out in the countryside at all. And all that's helpful, you know, they use it for other purposes, fairly obviously. Yeah. And, and we also share with other people as well. So um, we have uh, one employee, Scottish Wildlife Trust, working with us on this project at the moment. And she's been with us before. She's great. And we work with other uh, charities um, like Leonard Cheshire, um, like in, 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 um, Enable, um, like National Autistic Society. You know, and they're getting things from helping people to experience different experiences so this all helps everybody this does really you know instead of it being if it was just based on ecology it would be well someone's going to have to go to university and done a degree in fact a lot of them phds now you know so they're very experts in the things that they do uh, and other people can get really left behind with that you know it's um uh, a whole strange experience but um yeah i've seen some of the film of our um group of asylum seekers from glasgow out at a, at a campfire they're at you know uh, and having a great time moving on <laughs> apart from learning about wildlife obviously yeah. yeah so what does the future look like for badgers in the next let's say five or ten years and what is what could be your role as a you know your organization's role in in that future well it's a good question victor um it's carrying on what we're doing we want to make it a safe place for badgers i mean we don't really want to have habitat or places where badgers can't live because they can actually live and survive in all sorts of places i've sort of hinted at so it's about acceptance of them it's maybe we're all going to be a bit more crowded together actually when you think about it i mean yeah. this is um i mean i yeah i've been to some other countries in the world and this is a crowded even scotland's quite a crowded country <laughs> Yes, you know, <laughs> um, and um, yeah, um, but at the same time, got some big open spaces as well, you know, so there should be room for everybody, really. And, and, and I mean, farming practices are going to change as well. That's the other thing that is really large. So um, if far more hills and mountains are tree covered, that's going to help a whole lot of um, species anyway, especially badgers. Um, unfortunately sheep and deer eat virtually everything off mountains at the moment you know you, until you, they're taken off you don't realize quite what that's like um so yeah um it might be large arable areas don't have many badgers I and mean, that's that's what it is now i mean i live in angus you know and that's virtually prairie farming i mean we've no field margins left you know not even walls or fences it's usually because there's no livestock open to the road which means dust blows off it actually in windy weather. Um, and that's not very healthy actually for any wildlife at all, unfortunately, you know, birds or, or mammals. So we'll have to see, so we'll just carry on, you know, singing the same song really, um, fighting the same fight. But it, it'll be about um, people accepting things, you know, and learning about things as well. And going back to where we started, the thing about the badger, because some people, many people don't see them. That includes farmers, actually. They don't actually know what they do and how they live. You know, it's it's a secret sort of life. So we, we've got that to talk about more. Interesting. So is there anything you would like to share with our viewers and listeners? Um, or is there any way, if they want to support you and your organization or learn a bit more about your organization where should yeah. they where should they go to if they go to our website they can join us from there they can see things activities to join in um we're after a range of volunteers all the time i mean there's other jobs that obviously apart from surveying people need to do we're a charity you know has to run uh, and we have to raise money as well um but we, we train some volunteers to a high level so for example helping the police 
Um, I dealt with one this afternoon, actually, someone who has got to go to a situation um, in, in the north of the country. And she she's very competent, but she hasn't done a police statement before. So I was helping her about what's got to happen about that. And we need people like that who are experts. So all I started as amateurs, I mean, I moved out to the countryside 35 years ago. There was a badger set at the back of the house. That was it, you know, and I was, uh, that was me. I was off. <laughs> look back. Um, and that happens to quite a few people as well. well. Welcome people who want to join us in any way. Yeah. Amazing. Well, this was a lovely chat. We learned a lot about badges and your organization and what the future looks like and, you know, all the troubles that we have right now. But it can also um, get better if we all work on it and we learn more about yeah. badgers so it was great that we did this interview and everyone can learn a bit more uh, so yeah i want to thank you for your time and your cooperation 